Texas novelist William Humphrey once wrote, If the Civil War is more alive to the Southerner than to the Northerner, it is because all of the past is. And this is so because the Southerner has a sense of having been present there himself in the person of one or more of his ancestors. It is this feeling of identity with the dead who are past which explains the Southerner. It is with kin, not causes, that he is linked. Confederate great-grandfather is not remembered for his part in the Battle of Bull Run. Rather, Bull Run is remembered because great-grandfather was there. For the Southerner, the Civil War is in the family. Statue critics say he fought for slavery, but fewer than 30% of Southern families own slaves. According to historian William C. Davis, the northern myth that Confederates went to the battlefield to perpetuate slavery is just that, a myth. Their letters and diaries in the tens of thousands reveal again and again they fought because their southern homeland was invaded. Few today comprehend the magnitude of their sacrifice. About 300,000 Confederate soldiers died when the region's population was only 9 million. If the United States were to suffer proportional casualties in a war today, our losses would total over 11 million. Given such oblations, the Confederate soldiers' surviving family members wanted to memorialize him. A year after the war, the ladies of Columbus, Mississippi spread flowers on the graves of both the Confederate and Union dead in the town cemetery. Their gesture started a movement that eventually led to our National Memorial Day. Since the war had impoverished the South, for years there was no money for statues, and Union veterans initially opposed them. But when the sons of Confederate veterans eagerly joined the U.S. Army to help win the 1898 Spanish-American War, the aging Union Civil War soldiers concluded that their formal rivals were also Americans deserving of their own memorials. Thus, the 20 years from 1898 to 1918 witnessed the installation of 80% of the signature courthouse square Confederate statues still familiar in southern towns. Memorial placements north and south surged between 1911 and 1915 because it was the war's semi-centennial and the old soldiers were fading away. Presently, a vocal minority holds the Confederate soldier in contempt. Much like many civilians who sneered at returning Vietnam veterans in the 1960s, most Americans old enough to remember that era now cringe with shame when recalling such incidents. Since a popular maxim warns, whoever marries the spirit of this age will find himself a widower in the next, politicians should be wary of tearing down century-old monuments. Dishonoring them also demeans later generations of American warriors who were inspired by the Confederate soldier. Consider that post-Civil War Southerners consistently volunteered to defend our nation more readily than did other Americans. Presently, 44% of our military are from the South, even though the region represents just 36% of the country's population. Texan Audie Murphy was the most decorated soldier of World War II. Arkansas sniper Carlos Hathcock killed more enemy than anyone in Vietnam. During World War II, the first American flag to fly over the captured Japanese fortress at Okinawa was a Confederate battle flag. Marines put it there to honor their South Carolina company commander that had been cut down by a paralyzing wound on the final assault. Academics lead those seeking to remove Confederate statues, which they characterize as racist. But in doing so, they violate the American Historical Society's own caution against the fallacy of presentism, which is defined as uncritical tendency to interpret the past in terms of modern values. It fails to recognize that racial attitudes throughout America 150 years ago were different than today. That is why Abraham Lincoln said during an 1858 debate, I am not, nor ever have been, in favor of bringing about 
in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. Finally, since the mob sport of toppling Confederate statues is like kicking a puppy, it is likely to spread to include other historical figures. Anti-statue activists are like the former Soviet leaders who censored and rewrote history in order to put a state-sanctioned spin on the past. In response, George Orwell warned, the most effective way to destroy a people is to deny and obliterate their own understanding of their history. For Abbeville Institute, I am Philip Lee. Thanks for watching.